why we asked him to conduct this webinar. It all started on an internal call we had at Scatter a fortnight ago. We noticed a sharp rise in video communication, collaboration tools, and a burst of webinars. We saw two kinds of webinars. One, which were organized to sell products and services, and the other one, which brought in domain experts and key opinion leaders to share their knowledge and shed light on the slow path to the impending future or how to address the new normal. As content marketing pioneers, we are driven by the need to make an even stronger case for our practice. At Scatter, we've believed in the power of high quality, well-timed and valuable content. And this can clearly be seen in the content we create for our partners, as well as our own blog. We therefore knew that if we conducted a webinar that extols the values of content marketing, it needs to come in from the biggest and the most accomplished names in the business which is why we connected with Robert Rose. I have been extremely lucky to personally witness Robert's brilliance in keynote addresses and interviews that he does at the biggest content marketing show run in Cleveland every year. Robert has been the force behind Content Marketing World, Content Marketing Institute, and he's an author on many books on marketing, like Killing Marketing. His friend Joe Pulizzi and he actively believe that marketing departments can transform to being profit centers from cost centers. I highly recommend that you add this book, Killing Marketing, to your reading list if you haven't read it as yet. Robert also runs fantastic podcasts. I have no hesitation in calling him a content marketing guru. He consults for the world's largest organizations and is a gentleman who practices what he preaches. In a few moments from now, Robert will dwell on the holy trinity of content marketing which is storytelling, strategy, and technology. He will share his thoughts for the next 45 minutes or so. We will then open it to a few questions. Kindly type in your questions on the Q&A section of Zoom. I will ask Robert a few of the most asked and relevant questions. If you are tweeting, I'd encourage you to please use the hashtag, engage unfoolishly. Robert is doing this live from LA and it's pretty late in the night there. So we'd ideally like to close this webinar at around 11 a.m. IST. Lastly, before I invite Robert Rose, I'd like to thank our partners, IAMAI, FE Brandwagon, and Zero Zero. On that note, I'm now going to get Robert to, um, I'm going to get Robert to start his presentation. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, yes, it is, it, it is a little past my bedtime here in Los Angeles, um, but I guess uh, I'm getting old because it's, it is only 9.30 here. So um, uh, it's, uh, it, is, it is getting a little late, but, and I should probably have a glass of wine in my hand um, right about now. But in, I'm so honored to be here, and I'm so honored that you all uh, decided to join, um, and thank you so much for that. Um, and I do want to talk a little bit about content marketing in this new normal, where we are, and all of the things that we're all dealing with. Let me first just wish that you're all hopefully safe, home, your kids are fed, they're educated, they're getting warm meals, and everybody's doing well in this very weird and extraordinary time. Um, and for the next 40 minutes, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about the future where we see content marketing and what's going on, but also I think a broader spectrum of something that we see anyway, which is an opportunity, I think, for us to make a change that isn't necessarily new. Um, I'm going to share my screen now, and I'm also going to go off video just so that uh, I don't have to look at my ugly picture um, while I do this. And so I'll stop the video. And then I'll also share my screen here. Fantastic. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the what, what I would call the what, the so what, uh, and what we're talking about what now. And as I mentioned, we are gonna talk a little bit about content marketing, but what I'm also going to do is talk a little bit about 
some of the things that are going on now that we we want to think about um, as uh, as we as we as we go along here. Um, and so one of the things that I think we want to think about is two things that we're hearing just a lot about, uh, which is someone you know said to me the other day they were like, when are things going to get back to normal? And I think that's the most popular idea that I'm hearing right now. And it seems to be high on the list of everybody uh, that I talk to. And maybe the only thing that's drowning that out is this idea of things are never going to be normal again. And I think both of those things are kind of wrong um, because I do think we will get back to some level of normalcy. But I also think that it may be different than what we've experienced. And when it comes to the way that we communicate and we market and sell as a business, what I want us to do is take a moment at some point, at some point when it makes sense, when we're through the other side of this, and I want us to do what's called critical reflection, a critical reflection on the things that we can keep and the things that we should change in ourselves. And let me explain a little bit about what I mean by that. So 20 years ago, uh, there was a guy and his name is, uh, he's still alive. His name is Gary Rolfe and he's a professor of nursing at Swansea University in the UK. And he developed uh, and described this very helpful framework for self-reflection. He called it critical reflection. And it speaks to self-reflection and communication. And he wrote a book called Critical Reflection for Nursing and Anybody in the Helping Professions. And in it, he said that regardless of the magnitude of our choices, um, we, when they present themselves to us, we can take a critical reflection that offers a method for helping us to think and act in a mindful and considered and systematic way to make crucial decisions that whatever our practice in life is demands. And this idea of critical reflection, it's, as he was saying, it's not that we don't reflect a lot on decisions. We do, of course. But what we typically do is we make these reflections in the moment. So, for example, we may take a different way home from work and there's this horrible traffic jam and we think to ourselves, well, all right, that's no good. I'm never going to do that again. In other words, we only make the decision about what the future holds without reflecting upon what it was that made us make that decision in the first place and why we wanted to go a different way or, or what a different way could have been for us. And so his idea of critical reflection is really based around three simple questions. The first is what, where what we're doing is describing a situation and focusing on consequences, responses, feelings, any specific challenges of that situation. Then there's so what, where we discuss what we've learned about ourselves we develop models, attitudes, and changes to improve that situation. And then finally, now what? Where we identify what we're gonna do in the future in order to improve the outcome or develop our learning. And in any crisis, any sort of disruptive crisis or experience, we all go through these three questions naturally in real time. And we bring our own biases and reactions to that situation. So the challenge is, of course, is that we don't actually critically reflect in real time. Because so what we do is we answer each question as the situation unfolds, just like our decision to never go that way again because there was a traffic jam. And you can see this even happening now in the current crisis that we're facing. So in the early days, for example, of the current pandemic, there were definitions, there were consequences, forecasted ramifications of what it is we were facing, and those definitions were communicated to us. And then that influenced the so what of the models of how we would respond, the attitudes toward the change, and the recommended remedies that would be there. And now there are differing of, you know, sort of maturity levels or levels of, of where we are around the planet, of course, but especially here in the States and, and, and maybe there as well, we are beginning to be squarely, I would say, in the now what? Now what do we do stage? And we can already start to see that lessons learned, forecasts for the next or the new normal, they're all coming. And this is especially true when we start looking at marketing or sales departments. So what you'll no doubt see over the next few weeks and months is not reflection, 
but rather people asking, what's next? What do we do next? What, and what now, that question, is not asking what's next. So what I mean by that is that when you look out of, over all of these things that you'll see over the next few weeks and months, it's all going to be about predicting the new. You know, what new marketing should look like, what new advertising should look like, what the new strategies should be. And all of those different kinds of things will be focused in on all of the new strategies we should be taking as part of what we're doing in marketing. And just like any other crisis that has happened before and the one before that and the one before that, each one of these moments in our shared history are unique. And so looking at them is no better at predicting the future than any other model we might look at. Now, as the quote generally attributed to British statistician George Box says, all models are wrong, but certainly some are useful. As Box would go on to describe that models are approximations, right? They're assumptions. And so the question we should be asking is, is this not is this model true? Of course, it never is. The right question is, is it good enough to help me understand a problem? And this is something we can actually take with us. This is something we can actually use. Now, before I go any further, let me just admit something. I want to fully recognize there's an irony here, right? I'm on a webinar right now talking to all of you out there in the morning and talking to you about what changes are going to be in content and marketing and what we feel is really important without recognizing that what we're not really doing here is critically reflecting as much as I'm going to be suggesting a couple of models for you to succeed in. So as an aside, what I'd like you to do, what I'd urge you to do is take time when we're on the other side of this, when you're on the other side of this and you're through this, take the time to truly reflect in the coming days and ask not just what new price point you need to adjust to in the current price crisis or you know, where you are, what new price point or, or, or the sub brand you might launch or the money that you're gonna spend in digital or email or television, but also reflect on the way your company, your business operates, asking, the what, the so what, and the what now. Now, with that said, I'd like to actually, you know, actually think about this for a moment because, you know, this happening in real time, this is, this is going on. We're, we're dealing with this moment in real time where we want to speak through the crisis and create these, this valuable content. So as recently, literally as last week, the CMO of the giant uh, beer company, Anheuser-Busch, came out and he said they've moved out of advertising models full stop. They said the content that they produce now has to be consumer centric, never self-serving. And he said, there's no space now for us in anything that's not adding value to people. It's about relevance. And the political candidate for the US president here, uh, Joe Biden, he's just announced this last week that he's launched a newsletter and a podcast to his audiences to offer up thought leadership, valuable news, uh, because as he said, there's no getting through the noise right now in the news. And as Biden's move illustrates, when you can't get the attention of the media in PR or your rallies that you're holding, what you have to do, as he said, is become the media. So as media, technology, and brands have been democratized to have these different relationships with audiences, well, what we've seen be truly effective is something that we naturally do during crises like this. When we start thinking like the drive home, when we never say we never want to go that way again, we forget that there might be a wonderful reason or a thing we did during that crisis that we want to keep, that we should have changed permanently. Content, creating valuable content for our customers is one of those things. We've seen brands and survive and thrive over the last 20 years after they've developed a well-trained muscle, an operation to deliver trusted, valuable content and communications, a central strategy for the business to be able to establish itself as a trusted and valuable communication channel, which during a crisis sounds, yes, that's exactly what we wanna do, but after the crisis is just as important, maybe even more so. 
not just the ability to produce advertising, not just the ability to quickly launch a digital channel or create a feel good TV ad or radio or digital videos on a YouTube, but a muscle, a skill, a competency to develop valuable, trustworthy content consistently, ongoing, over time, to become a trusted source of valuable content. So whenever we're in a crisis, we think about three communication focuses. So the first one is, of course, establishing trust. We have to establish trust right away. So even in 1918, in the Spanish flu, right, there was an ad from a telephone company actually telling people, don't use the telephone, so that emergency responders could actually get through to drugstores and doctors. But there was also the tone deaf ads, you know, the, the horrible ads that you would get from products that were trying to sell and actually do things and take advantage of the, of the disease. That this one advertising you could get better, quite frankly, from the prompt use of this cough medicine. So establishing trust with an audience is absolutely incredibly important in, during a crisis. The second is, of course, figuring out how to optimize channels for those communications. We are creative people. You are all creative people. In marketing, we get extraordinarily creative about the way that we can get messages out, and we all scramble during a crisis to be able to do that. For example, during and after the 9-11 tragedy, American Airlines, what they would do is they would transcribe voicemails from their CEO into the Sabre ticketing system to keep their ticket agents informed about all the things that were going on because none of them had smartphones or internet access. Morgan Stanley, the big financial services firm, they rededicated one of their consumer helplines to their discovery credit card and made it an employee information line. One that's a personal story for me is that back in 2005, I was the CMO of a software company and we were one of the earliest, you know, sort of software as a service or cloud-based companies in web content management. And one of our customers was a New Orleans based business. And on Monday, August 29th, 2005, Hurricane Katrina hit. And we started noticing that this company was submitting this unusual amount of new digital assets into their content management system. So trying to be good customer service, we looked into it. And as it turns out, their marketing department, since our software was the, one of the only things that was running and they all had remote access to it and basically created this communication channel through the CMS. They were asking each other by assigning each other digital asset tasks, is everything okay? Here's the strategy for tomorrow when we're going to communicate with the employees. They were simply using our software to communicate. They scrambled to find a way. And we know these things. We have innovated these same kinds of things. The final thing is, of course, creating an operational model and creating an operational model that quickly comes together as a team to figure out how we're going to communicate in a consistent tone of voice, in a consistent way, and through these channels. Also, after 9-11, one of my favorite stories of this is the computer maker Dell so they got this new executive operating group together in the days after, and they created this operational center of excellence, as well as this content web hub that developed this valuable education, inspiration, and assistance for employees and the Dell customers. Now, this internal website might be called an internal early attempt at content marketing because the ongoing operation was to consistently deliver valuable content and education without regard to trying to sell anything or optimize a revenue goal or do anything like that. But of course, it supported all of those things because it helped get customers back on their feet in this scary time. Months later, when they actually went back and did a look back to see if it was effective, they got 60,000 visits in the first two months, averaging about 600 visits a day and 11,000 unique visitors during the eight weeks that it was up, about a third of its workforce. So they saw that 90% of the employees thought that the webcasts and content that was produced during that time was amazingly helpful for their job and relevant to the company and helped them get their customers successful again. Now, all of these are stories, they're just stories. And I've heard plenty of amazing stories coming out of this disaster, and I'm sure you have as well. The innovative new you know, ways that we're using Zoom and WebEx and GoToMeeting and the ways that the supply chain is getting innovated. And here's my question. My question is when we think about content, strategic content and these three ideas of establishing trust, optimizing channels and operational models for content, 
And I don't mean to throw Dell under the bus here or American Airlines or Morgan Stanley, but my question is, why do we only do these things during a crisis? Why is content, delivery of valuable content, that creates a wonderful and valuable experience for our customer, not a core strategy or a function in our business? Why is it not something that we do when we're not in the midst of a crisis? So when we actually do our reflection and think about what we should do in the future, what I'm hopeful for is that one of the things is not just to try and predict whether we should put more money into TV or digital email or whether we should launch that sub brand or SEO or whoa, those things. Those things are gonna come, I promise you, those things are gonna come. We will do all of the necessary things, put out the ads that say we're here for you and all of those things. What will not be as obvious will be our reflections, how we can change and keep some of the operational things that we're going to build as a way of communicating value to our customers. And content marketing is a key piece of what one of those things that I hope that we can begin to keep. Because when we think about content marketing, we ask ourselves, can we connect company content that we create and effective communications? And that's what content marketing is. When you look at our definition of content marketing in the, you know, when we defined it for the last really 20 years, we talk about it being a strategic approach to marketing that focuses on creating and distributing relevant and consistent content to attract and retain a clearly defined audience. And so we can do that. And if we can do that as a functional strategy in our business, we have a lot we can gain from that. We have a lot we can gain from that. But in order to do that, we have to have a strategy. We have to think through our strategy. And so when we think about that, that corporate muscle, that central team, that ability for a corporate business to be able to, one, create trusted content that delivers value to any audience that needs or wants it. Two, creating an agile operation that can deliver value in any kind of situation, crisis or otherwise. And three, measure and scale that operation as the business calls for it. This is my, you know, my urging for CFOs, and it's what I'm telling clients, it's what we're seeing happen here in the States, of looking at content as much more important as a marketing and communication strategy than almost any time before. So if we believe that, if we believe that content marketing, content strategy is good, what are the things that get in our way? What should we do first? What should our priorities be when we start thinking about that? So a model, yes, for sure. I've, I'm going to be prescribing a model and hopefully it's somewhat useful for you. These are the things that we've seen be effective in thinking about a content marketing strategy. Now, generally speaking, our content planning framework has five components. Uh, these are the pressure points when we examine, when we work with clients and look at their maturity model, the muscle strength of their organization and the content marketing approach. And so the five pieces that we typically look at in a strategy are one, resources. How are the teams constructed? Who are the teams? How, are the, how is the investment being spent? Two, purpose. What is the purpose of this group, its function, its remit, its charter? What is it trying to build and what operating model is it working through? And three, the audience. Who are the audiences defining those personas, figuring out how we understand what they need to hear and what they want to hear so that they want to hear from us. And then we call it frame. These are governance structures, technologies, looking at infrastructure, how does content flow in the business? And then lastly, the value. ROI, looking at the investment value, how are we measuring what success looks like? And for each of these in a strategy, we look at outputs where we define the model and the team who have goals and a specific focus. They define that based on trying to engage a specific audience persona and tell them, deliver them value through storytelling, then deliver that through a prescribed governance and process and ultimately return on investment. So this is our five, and we certainly don't have all time to go through all five. Today, we have entire workshops and, and, and boot camps to go through these kinds of strategies.
But what I wanted to focus on were three priorities for change, things you can think about as you're coming out the other side, as part of your reflection, some of the things that might be helpful for you as you start thinking through your content strategy. The first is I wanna talk a little bit about new audience insights. The contextual journey of the existing experiences you have. You have a website already. You have an email newsletter, maybe. You have a blog, perhaps. And all of these things will give you, and they should be changing now. Your content calendar, your strategy should not look the same as it did pre-COVID. The second thing I wanna talk about is investing in content that develops trust and confidence. Why you can't rebuild trust, but why trust can be built. And then lastly, I wanna focus on that operating model. Really figuring out where you are and giving you a bit of a way to look at it and where you might focus your new operating model because it's gonna answer a lot of questions that you may have around complaints you may be hearing about scalability, about measurability, et cetera. So let's look at these quickly in turn so that we've got some time for questions. The first is these new audience insights. So when we think about content marketing, I want you to think about it in comparison to a classic marketing process. So in other words, when we think about a classic marketing process, what does it start with? It starts with what we learned in university, which was about reach and frequency. Reach and frequency helps us target audiences, broadcast audiences, and what do we wanna do? We want to create demand generation programs that turn them into visitors. Visitors to our shop, visitors to our e-commerce store, visitors to our website. Then ultimately we want to do something we might call lead nurturing to turn those people into shoppers so that they put things in their shopping basket, so that they actually call a salesperson and want a demonstration of our software, so that they want more information about that product that is really expensive. And then what we do is through a sales process, we turn some of those into customers and some of those through retention and loyalty program then become advocates. The classic funnel shape marketing shape built in. It is a filter. It filters people down to smaller groups over time. Now, of course, the way we've been doing this for a hundred years as students of marketing is that this funnel is measured one way and that's by cost. It has to be, it's a filter. We are rewarded as marketers by how good we are at pushing people through the various filters here. So we measure cost per customer, cost per opportunity cost per lead and cost per thousand. Content marketing is different. It's not better than, it's not worse than, it's just different. It emphasizes audience and the insights and development that we can make with audiences as the asset itself. So yes, it starts with an anticipated audience that we want to reach, but what we wanna do is deliver value to them through content that turns them into an engaged audience, someone who wants to hear from us, someone who has chosen to actually do business with us in the way that they engage with our content, they're getting value from it. Then hopefully what we're doing is we're transforming them into what we would call a subscribed audience, an addressable audience. So email address, text number, physical address, physical business address, showing up physically or online to an event. We get to address them at our choosing, they become our audience that we can monetize because once they become addressable, we can now model them against goals. We can get corporate goals set up for audiences, not just lead generation, not just sales goals, but multiple goals that can help us deliver value to that audience and to the business over time. This is a content marketing process and it's measured in two ways. One is as the audience size grows, it gets more valuable because the goals that it support will be supported more deeply. And two, the investment value will grow because the number of goals it will support. The key is, is that demonstrated value content marketing is a multiplier. In other words, by delivering value first to a customer out there becoming a trusted source of valuable, interesting, educational, inspirational things, we're saying we're here for you from the very beginning. What that does is that it makes everything else that follows easier. In other words, when I've already demonstrated trust to you, when I now say, trust me, you're gonna like this product, you're gonna like this service, I want you to get a demonstration, I want you to do those things, we will already have built-in affinity for our approach. 
And then when we say, we want you to commit to our product or we want you to be more loyal to it, you will because you will see others just like you in that audience. That's where content marketing becomes a multiplier of everything we do in business. It's as simple as this. It's treating audiences as we would customers. Now, when we think about audiences, we think about them in this way, right? We think about buyer personas. And maybe some of you out there have done buyer persona segments. Maybe if you've thought about it, you've done the research. Typically, when we look at buyer personas, we look at them against these seven um, elements or attributes, right? Who are they? Their gender, their age, their education. What do they do? Their job. What are their primary pain points? What do they value most? Where do they go for information? What's important? And what are their common objectives? And so when we think about those things, those are great for buyer personas. The challenge is, is that there's a difference between buyer personas and audience personas. Buyer personas are already self-identified. They're already far along the right of that diagram we just looked at. They're already needing our product or solutions. So we're already claiming to be the most important part of their life before we've delivered that value. Audience personas can help with that. Now, we can work through audience personas and the real differences there and how to develop audience personas another day. But what I want you to do is I want you to take stock of where you are right now because the attributes that you've assembled for your buyer personas right now assume something life is normal. And the key is, is that life is not normal. So even your current buyer personas, even your current audiences should be right now and perhaps temporarily segmented in a different way. So we've seen four elements come up a lot, which we really like to do is we start segmenting our messaging or segmenting content to different parts of your audience. So we call this one, the life is not the same person. Two, the sensitive but sane person. The three, the what, me, worry person. And then four, the YOLO, the you only live once person. And the, where this comes into factor is when we start looking at this segmentations, right? So life isn't the same person. These are people that are really worried right now. Buying is going to stop. They're likely going to go inward. They don't want to engage in anything. They likely want to eliminate anything that is going to upset their world right now because they're completely focused. Then there's the sensitive but sane where they're going to lean on fame, uh, favorite trusted brands and they're looking for deals. They may cut expenses deeply but they'll continue to look with justification and maybe even increase usage with some of their favorite trusted brands. Then there's the what me worry persona, which is they're gonna be more selective, but they're generally on the hunt for new things. All purchases are justifiable to them, but they might be closest to our normal persona attitude, maybe a little more skeptical. And then there's what we call the YOLO, which is hungry, ready for new. Now, they may be looking to look to switch providers right now, not just something new, but they're looking for opportunities. Now, we often think of these as like, oh, that's our opportunity for new customers. But quite frankly, these can be existing customers that we want to make sure that we're shoring up because they may be out there looking right now for more favorable or innovative solutions than us. Now, what you can do is you can start to look at your current content and your messaging. We encourage you to look across four areas where you've got four different kinds of content being created. Promoter content. Promoter content is sales or marketing content, pure and simple. This is your 10% off or $10 off coupon. Then you've got preacher content, targeting interests and passions and driving engagement. And this might be like your internet of, uh, you know, here a white paper called the internet of things and how it's going to change your life. Maybe a, a, an article or a blog post. Then you have professor content, which is, educational content, driving trust because it's teaching you something, it's educating you to something. An example of this might be a white paper called the 10 best practices for writing a white paper. And then you've got poet content, which is feelings, emotions, entertainment, make you laugh, make you cry, driving belief. So start to segment your content and then segment it by those different attitudes in your current audience. And start asking yourself, filling in these boxes with, are we actually communicating in the right way to the right people right now? Are we segmenting our content in the right way? Are there gaps in what we're doing right now? Are we not speaking to the YOLO person right now? And we really need to make sure that we're actually creating some content for that person 
in this moment because this will be important. So hopefully this can be a little bit of a worksheet for you as you start thinking through how you might segment your content and start developing more segmented ways of looking at your audiences. The second piece I wanna to talk to is this idea of trust and confidence. And trust and confidence is a huge thing right now, not only in the midst of this crisis, but where we're actually developing our content. And so it starts right now with even understanding that even pre-COVID, we were already in a crisis of trust. I don't have to remind any of you guys uh, out there about Edelman's trust barometer and how low it is right now and where trust is generally in the world, especially in my country where we have you know, all kinds of problems with trust right now. Um, don't even get me started on that whole thing. But basically when we start thinking about it, trust is a huge issue. Trust in technology, trust in government, trust in media, trust everywhere. We need to understand that trust is an opportunity for us as a brand because we can get there. Now, we need to understand what the problem is though. One of my heroes of the world is of course, Clayton Christensen. And as he said so well, understanding a problem is the most crucial part of actually uh, solving that problem. So in short, any effort to increase trust has to actually start with foundational questions that we wanna ask ourselves about our content and our communications. So what is trust? How can we build or rebuild it with consumers? What are the elements or the components of trust that we should aim to look at, to highlight, to deploy and communicate? And how do we know if we're making progress? And so when we think that, about that first question, what is trust? Well, as, according to one scholar, which we really like, this is a, a, a great definition uh, of, of trust. Trust is a state of mind that enables its possessor to be willing to make herself vulnerable to another. That is to rely on another despite a positive risk that the other will act in a way that can harm the truster. And so the, this is a really important element here. First, trust is a state of mind, an attitude. So in a commercial relationship like marketing or any kind of business, it's the attitude the buyer or maybe a partner like a dealer or whatever has about the seller or the brand. Then trust involves a vulnerability and it involves a passage into an uncertain future, how the other person or other party is going to act, but how they will act is unknown. This is what we call the two vectors of trust, uncertainty and vulnerability. And both of these must be in play for a trust relationship to occur. If you're certain of the outcome, then there's no reason to trust. For example, if I invite you to fall backwards with a pledge that I'm gonna catch you, but you know that I'm an Android programmed to unfailingly catch every single human that ever is falls backward, you don't need to, and quite frankly, can't trust me because there is no uncertainty. And if there's no vulnerability, if the outcome is not some way potentially harmful, well then trust is also irrelevant. If I should fail to catch you, for example, but you're not gonna land on a floor, but a soft you know, bunch of pillows, well then trust is not a factor there. And so the trust researcher, Rachel Bossman, what she said, I think is really interesting, is she said, trust is a confident relationship to uncertainty. It allows you to bridge the gap between what I'm now saying and what I'm going to do, the possibility that I may not do it. So here's the question, can we increase or rebuild the amount of trust we have? Well, as it turns out, no, it's actually impossible. See, it's impossible to rebuild trust because as Honora and Neil says, the scholar, she says, you can't give it, trust is distinctive because it's given to you by others. You can't rebuild what other people give you. In other words, you can't make somebody love you. And that's the key here. And that brings us to our second takeaway here, which is something I'm hoping you can look at and overall take a look at where your content, your communication is with your consumers right now. We call this our four pillars of trustworthiness. So you look at it and you've got integrity, empathy, competence, and reliability. And so what you can do is you can start to assess yourself and look at your content and communications and assess yourself against that. Now, self-assessment obviously 
is you know not something that you want to just rely on so, totally because it doesn't really matter how trustworthy you think you are but getting a good sense of where you internally think you are and then going out and asking or figuring out from customers where you actually are can help reveal the delta of where your brand where your content is you know integrity do your stories and messages and commitments do they express your brand promise empathy do you demonstrably understand customer needs and goals? And then competence. Where are you actually in terms of competence and what are you particularly good at? How is it expressed in your communications? This can be taken alongside your audience audit and can start to give you some immediate to-dos in terms of the content you need to create to create deeper and more involved trust. And so this internal assessment then brings us to the third and last piece, which is establishing an operating model. And so whenever I'm out working with clients or I'm at a workshop or I'm really just looking at a conference and the two most common questions I get are, hey, we're having a real problem scaling our content strategy. You know, we basically got one or two people trying to create blogs and emails and websites and it's really hard to scale this. How will we do that? And the third, or excuse me, the second is actually, how do we actually measure this? And it usually comes across some complaint, right? If somebody will say to me, we can't use a blogging tool in our business. We don't know how, we, we don't have the budget for it. Or our editorial calendar right now is just a to-do list. Or somebody will say to me, you know, anybody with a budget right now can publish to our big corporate website. Or we're not allowed to capture subscriber data because of GDPR or other data privacy issues. Or we don't know how to create video. Or sales doesn't even use the content we create. Whenever I hear one of these complaints or challenges to scalability and measurability, what it tells me is, is that there's a no operating model or a flawed operating model. So we look at the operating models of content as the core foundational element of creating any good content strategy. And basically, we've identified four different operating models that are typical within a content operation. And so it starts in the lower left with a siloed service that is typically internally focused, basically supporting internal teams, and we call it the player model, which is content as contributor. This is the most common model. It is where we've got those two or three people submitting assets into the business. And it can work very strategically. It can be a very good operating model given the right goals, the right purpose, the right technology, and the right uh, strategy. Then if you move up and you start more focusing on externally focused audiences, but we're also a siloed service, this is where we move into the performer model, where we look at content as a product, a marketing strategy. This is where we have a blog or a resource center or a magazine, and we're trying to run it like an editorial product. And we actually have a very specific cadence a strategy, a contribution goal, where we're trying to get to those different ways of publishing content on a regular basis and build a focused audience. Then in the upper, or excuse me, the lower right, we have what we call the processor model, where we have content as standards, protocols, guidelines, taxonomies, uh, translation management, uh, localization management, where content becomes a company integrated business service but is spread through the service like a protocol is, like a guideline, a standard, a training standard, all of those SEO, anything that is technically minded, creating content as a service. And then finally, we have what we call the platform model, which is content as a business, a business model itself, where content in a division may actually be revenue driving, it may actually save money. Red Bull's media house for the Red Bull soft drink is probably the most famous example of this. Now, most businesses have multiples of these models. And what we like to do is figure out where is the balance? Because a great balance across these models where we truly, as a business, understand the focus, the goals, the personnel, the team, those five metric areas that I went through in the very beginning of the presentation, that's where we wanna balance our models to be, uh, to be a, a truly intelligent content strategy. Let me give you just a couple of examples to wrap up here to sort of give you a, a, a sort of a context for this. So the player model. So this is again where we typically start. 
Red Hat Linux is a great computer company just recently acquired by IBM, of course, uh, for a, a lot of money. And the team there started literally as six people and they were squarely in the player model, contributing content into sales and doing their you know, SEO focused articles and doing all of the things that they needed to do. And they made it a very specific goal to do exactly that, to focus just on those particular creating those assets. They then expanded the team model by model to grow into the first, the performer model, where they then started to launch a blog and then a podcast and then an event and then uh, a community. And then they moved over to the right and they started developing standards for uh, guidelines and SEO and translation and localization. Now, Laura Hamlin's team there is 45 people of data scientists, journalists, editorial people, strategy, creative. Her whole content strategy drives really the marketing there. And it all started with the player model. Or we have the performer model where we're operating a publication. So this is Monster, monster.com, the job board and their career advice center. And their career advice center is a wonderful publication that teaches you how to get jobs. And so they do original research, they do original content that, uh, and video for classes on how to do your LinkedIn resume and how to get a job and how to do interviews, all of those things. They're now driving 60% uh, of all of their organic traffic comes through the Career Advice Center. And that's a nice case study. And you go, yeah, that's lovely. They get 60% of their organic traffic there. But more importantly, they've gotten 48,000 new members from the Career Advice Center. And they've estimated that if they had to pay through paid media to get those 48,000 members, it would have cost them $3 million. Now there is some cost here, obviously, in launching monster.com Career Advice Center, but the delta between what they would have had to have spent in advertising to what they got through the Career Advice Center organically is the value of the Career Advice Center. And I can tell you it's a highly profitable part of their marketing strategy. Or the processor model. So Salesforce is a huge, uh, wonderful company creating content all over and the different models. They've got their platform model, which of course is Dreamforce, which is driving revenue for them. They've got blogs and podcasts. They've got assets that they're creating for emails, of course. But one of the keys is their content council that actually creates standards and guidelines and training, formalized training. If you're going to create content for Salesforce, you actually have to go through training and get a standard way, the way that Salesforce creates all of the way that they do content. It is a service and a team and a focused operating model that they have for the entire business. And then finally, just because I love this case study so much, the platform model. So this is Raspberry Pi, the computer maker in Europe, and they've been publishing print magazines for a number of years. And one of my favorite examples of this, of course, is the magazines they've been publishing for years, Magpie and Hackspace and Wireframe and Hello World. But they've just recently acquired two magazines, Custom PC and Digital SLR Photography. They still maintain revenue streams. They sell advertising. They have a business model. They sell them on newsstands. And what I love so much about this is that it not only becomes a brand extension for them where they, uh, all, you know, they talk about the DIY idea and encourage kids to really get into building their own computers and electronics, but all of the revenue goes to fuel their nonprofit purpose-driven education strategy. So for this, this is a social corporate responsibility uh, initiative for them as much as it is a marketing strategy. So the key is find your balance. Where are you? Are you imbalanced in your operating model or do you have balance? Do you have a marketing support focus? where you've got really people focused on the performer model and maybe a little bit on the player model, really focusing in on marketing? Or is yours more of a publishing focus where you have very little of asset creation, but you're producing magazines or blogs or external functions? Or are you a standards-based model where you're really focused on getting sharp on SEO and translation, localization, standards across the entire organization? and some assets, but you don't have a publication quite yet? Or are you looking at a balanced model where you're looking at balancing the teams across those different areas? Each has functional goals, each has functional strategies and team structures, and those five areas of pressure points like we talked about before. It's important. Getting the operating model right 
is what actually creates the ability to create the functional governance, the rules, and the way that things scale. And that gives you the ability to measure, to measure the different ways that content is helping move the business forward. As we move out of this and into the new, the key with content, and I'm really, really hopeful, is that we'll keep this idea of creating valuable content-driven experiences for our customers. At the end of the day, we are marketers, and I am a marketing fanboy since day one. I've been doing this for 25 years. And when I think about what the job of a marketer is, it is to make markets. We make markets where none existed before. And I can think of no better way to do that than to deliver valuable content to my customers every single day. I want to thank you so much for your time uh, today, this morning. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen while we get ready for questions. And hopefully um, I can answer some questions in the time we have remaining. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. That was fantastic. Um, we've got a few questions here. Um, I'm going to ask the first question, which is around uh, the education sector. We've got a couple of questions from there. Um, so these are two questions, but I think there's some kind of overlap. Uh, the first one is, how would content change from pre-COVID times for a digital educational platform? Um, the other question in the same place is how uh, does content, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, and what kind of contents marketing strategies should be adopted by education, educational institutions? So I think this, yeah. yeah, yeah all it's, a, it's a great question. Um, and, you know, what we've seen here anyway from uh, educational institutions like universities um, and secondary schools um, is incredible. Um, certainly, you know, from the university standpoint, when we think about educational and even on the private sector, too, about, you know, private schools and some institutions that are also focused on education, um, Content marketing is perhaps really the, the, the biggest focus that we see. Creating and demonstrating that value of the, the lesson plan and the things that you're going to learn and why this is an important, you know, whether it's a trade school or whether it's a, you know, a professional uh, university or whatever it happens to be, um, is really important um, to the marketing mix, just like it would be for really any company um, nonprofits uh, and NGOs are, are another sector where content marketing plays such an important role. How it differs now versus, you know, in this crisis versus how it either differs before or after this, the key to this is for, for me is truly sort of adopting what I call the right context for your education. In other words, we, it doesn't have to be our responsibility to be an expert in something we're not experts about. What we have to be mindful of is, is that the lens that we look through. So I was just telling this to a trade school the other day. I was saying, look, you don't have to be an expert in COVID or in disease or in epidemiology or anything like that. You shouldn't be putting out that kind of content for your audience anyway. But what you have to be mindful of is, what does your audience expect from you and want from you now? What does teaching the thing that you teach, how does it change in this world? So maybe it's teaching the students how to learn remotely. Maybe it's teaching what equipment we need to actually have to be able to learn in a remote and at home environment. Or perhaps in the future, it's how does the world of our particular educational focus change in this new world? The thinking is, how do we continue to deliver true value to the audiences that come to us with a very specific question, a very specific need, and start to think about your content that you're creating in the same way that you would a lesson plan, in the same way that you would a course, in the same way that you create your curriculum. That content should have the same level of importance and the same level of value as your curriculum. And if you think about it that way, I think, you know, independent of what it is you teach, 
you'll be really safe in terms of how you evolve from pre to during to post. Thank you, Robert. There's uh, another really interesting question um, asked by Abhay. It says, we generated good volume of audience and leads when our product was not that good. Now that we've improved the product, how should we regain the trust? <laughs> that's, uh, oh, that's great. I love that. Um, yeah. Well, here's the thing. You know, as you've just heard, you won't, right? The, the key is to focus in. So what it sounds like, yeah, I, I run into this a lot. This is a common problem here in the U.S., um, where the marketing is actually better than the product. So <laughs> I, I sympathize with you. Um, you know, the key is, is that you're already doing a great job, it sounds like. Um, and the challenge is, is that if you start to ask at that bottom of the funnels of sort of ongoing customer loyalty, customer, you know, you're probably still really focused in on that upper funnel brand, lead generation, et cetera. Sounds like you're doing great at that. And so it sounds like it's just going to need to be a shift in focus in terms of what kind of valuable experience, content-driven experience, can we start to deliver to customers to start to bolster this idea that they've actually gotten a really good product. I don't think you need to focus on, you know, sort of comparing, but I think what you need to do is, as we talked about in developing this trust, is really focus in on how do you start to bolster the content experience for customers that has high integrity and probably high competency rates so that you're demonstrating to them that not only is the product great, but the content and experience you're going to get after buying the product is also just as good. It's probably, it sounds like you've got a really skilled set of content creators, probably just a refocus of where you're putting all of that content and for what purpose and the audience and what they, what they need is, is, is probably the, the, the job at hand. Thank you, Robert. Uh, there's another question from Pankaj Chaudhary. He asks, how do we attribute the success and failure to content marketing initiatives amongst all marketing initiatives? It's a great is question. Possible, and is it possible to do it on a campaign to campaign basis? Or is it just in the long term that we will get to know the effectiveness? It's both. It's both. As we talked a little bit about, really, um, the idea of content marketing is as a multiplier. So the way I like to do it is I get really specific about what my goals are, given where my content is trying to serve. In other words, if my blog or my resource center or my website or my content is really serving a top of the experience uh, purpose, well, then that's where I'm going to focus all my goals. So my goals might literally be something like how many uh, organic leads am I putting into the funnel? That was Monster's real goal there, right? There's a top of the funnel experience and they said, how many organic visitors, how many organic searches, and how many organic leads are we actually putting into the funnel? If I compare that to what they're having to pay for, well, now I have a value. The delta between what am I generating given this cost for generating content versus cost of paid media or paid email or those kinds of things. That's one. You might look at, do customers that engage with content actually buy more? In other words, if customers that come to our blog or download content or engage, do they actually put more in their shopping cart? This is one of the great goals of uh, REI, which is a sporting goods uh, store here in the US. And they actually um, have uh, content into their e-commerce, which is they look at cross promotion of product and educating you. So if I go to buy a tent or camping gear, as I shop through the e-commerce store, I'm going to see educational content saying, you also need to know that you need these special stakes, you need this sleeping bag, all that stuff. So they actually measure themselves by how much the shopping cart is increased for those who actually engage with content. If you're focusing like the previous uh, asker of, of questions um, on the customer service, we might look at how does engagement with content help us increase loyalty or decrease the churn of customers out? Do the customers that sign up for our customer community typically stay longer or do they uh, say nicer things about us? We start looking basically at any part of the journey we're trying to optimize with our content. What's the delta between what those with content that engage with content do versus 
what do those that don't? In other words, what do audiences do in our favor that others that aren't engaged or aren't subscribed don't? And we've got, I, I, we can, if you go through our website, there's some other materials on, uh, on uh, measurement that, that's also there as well. Thank you. I'll ask you one last question um, before we uh, call this a day. Um, there's a question from Kamar Purohit. It says, do you think the uncertainty, um, the uncertainty given these times might force brands to pause or defer content activities and contracts? Since there is no certainty about when exactly the marketing would culminate into actual sales. You know, I, I, here's the way I would answer that. I think it's really hard for any of us to know right now. This is why I wanted to focus a little bit on reflection um, because one of the things, and I don't, you know, it, it's a hard thing here. It's certainly hard here in the US. Um, I obviously don't know the media landscape in India um, very well, but what I do know is here in the US, there are a lot of people who think they're predicting the future. They're out there every day telling us what's going to be, what's going to happen, what this is, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. And it's almost become a joke here in the US now about how little anybody actually knows about what the future holds. All I can do is change the way that I play the game. In other words, all I can do as a business owner, as a business leader, is help my team understand how we can change to deal with what it is we have today. So what I think is actually happening is we're going to come back to a level of normalcy a little faster than the world con continues to, you know, to say so. But I don't know that. I, I, I really don't. I don't have any empirical evidence for that. And so when I think about that, this is, this is the part, by the way, where I need a big glass of wine <laughs> to go with this. <laughs> um, but it's really this idea of, I think brands really need to do some self-reflection here and think about the way that they're communicating with customers. Because the one thing I do know is that if we focus on delivering value at every single step of the journey, we can never lose, no matter what happens. If I continually deliver value to my customers, my prospects, my ex-customers and new customers, then I, I always win. And so that's where I like to focus is how today, every day I get up and I say, how can I deliver more value to my customers? And I think you can't lose if you do that. Uh, thank you, Robert. That was an excellent session, a great presentation. Thank you for taking time out. I know it's well past bedtime for you <laughs> or the glass of wine time for you. Yeah. And thank you, audience, as well. Uh, we've had a great audience today. Um, uh, great questions. We'll try and see if we can answer some of the questions we haven't been able to answer yet. Uh, no guarantees, but uh, do check out the scatter blog and you know, we will try and have these answers there. Thanks again, Robert. Um, thank you so much. This is really, really good. And um, thank you for taking time out. Thank you very much for having me. And you guys have a great day and be safe and be well. All right. Thank you.